Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. And uh, uh, full disclosure, I, I know very little about LQG. I know what it stands for, <laughs> but that's, that's about it. Right? Uh, I know something about twister theory. So I'm going to tell you about twister theory, but I'm, I'm actually going to speak in some generalities about uh, symmetry and, um, and how that comes into play in uh, the development of uh, twister theory. And, and then Matchek, who will do a follow-up talk, will talk about much more specifics to do with actual twister theory. So, I mean, there'll be some twister theory in here, but it'll all be geared, it'll all be viewed from the point of view of uh, symmetry. Okay, so here are, some, here are some symmetries. This was working before. Yes, now it's working too well. Okay, symmetry, so twister theory works in four dimensions. So let's talk about twister theory in, in four dimensions. And of course, since we're talking about uh, physics, we're talking about uh, Lorentz transformations in four dimensions. And the first observation, which is uh, a little bit non-trivial and brings in, say, complex analysis or at least complex numbers right away, is the fact that the Lorentz transformations... So that's my notation for the connected component of the Lorentz group. <coughs> the Lorentz transformations are, are double covered by SL2C. And then of course, there's a standard bundles and yoga that people go through at this point. So spinners. Okay, so a fancy way of saying it is there's a, a low dimensional uh, coincidence between SL2C and uh, spin 1, 3. Okay, and in fact, as a consequence of this, the Lorentz transformations, as they affect our uh, sky, as, as, as they affect the celestial sphere, um, are actually, um, actually uh, conformal transformations. So, in other words, the right group to think of acting on the sky is SL2C. In other words, you should think of it as the Riemann sphere. Uh, so this was observed... Uh, <coughs> a long time ago, actually uh, 60 years ago. <laughs> RP stands for Roger Penrose. And 60 years ago, there was this uh, article, uh, The Apparent Shape of a Relativistically Moving Sphere. And uh, in particular, if you're looking at a sphere or a circle in, in your celestial sphere, and then someone comes whizzing past very fast and looks at the same thing from their point of view, then they will also see just a sphere or a circle. They'll see a circle. They, the, the individual features on the, on, the, on the sphere will be distorted, but the shape of the thing itself will still be a circle. And that's because, um, because you're really looking at the Riemann sphere. OK, so the next sort of group that you encounter in physics is the Poincaré group. And all you've done there is to Lorentz transformations, you've added in translations. So here's the same thing repeated again with translations. And there's not much, uh, not much going on there, relatively mild consequences. Of course, you have to have spinners in order to talk about fermions, but that's about it. More significant is what happens if you look at the conformal group. And the conformal group here means uh, the group of uh, transformations of uh, Minkowski space, or more precisely, compactified Minkowski space. Okay, so there's this nice uh, group. This is in including... Uh, not only the uh, Lorentz transformations and uh, translations, which are in the Poincaré group, but also inversions and uh, dilations. If you put all those together, you get the conformal group, which <coughs> as a group is, is, is this. But this one, just like the uh, Lorentz transformations, is also double covered. And it's also double covered by a group which has to do with complex numbers. In fact, another coincidence of low-dimensional Lie groups that SU22 uh, double covers the uh, conformal group. Okay, so this is a, a mathematical fact, but this is actually the basis of uh, twister theory. So the next article of Rogers uh, is in 1967, twister algebra. That's generally regarded as the birth of twister theory. So it's 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 uh, actually a, a Lie algebra version of, of this of this coincidence was explained in that article. 
OK, so the consequences there are twisted theory that has much more severe consequences than these relatively mild consequences for these earlier groups. Right, so <coughs> uh, the next thing, next thing which, is, which is present everywhere in twister theory, and also um, there were hints of it on the previous slide, is that there are complex numbers and complex analysis everywhere. And this comes about by complexification. And you can see this already on the Riemann sphere. So as a complex manifold, there's no doubt that the Riemann sphere should be viewed as a quotient of two complex uh, Lie groups. And one of them is SL2C, as previously observed. Um, but if you ask how uh, subgroups of SL2C act, then there's su significant things. So for example, um, if you look at the compact real form, so actually every complex semi-simple Lie group has, or Lie algebra anyway, has a, a unique uh, compact real form, in this case SU2, that always acts transitively. It's, uh, <coughs> the compact form is all, always the most boring. So here, here we've got something uh, acting transitively. It means that uh, mathematically just uh, CP1 is also, you can think of it as uh, this homogeneous space. If you want to think of it as a Riemannian manifold, that's how you should think of it. OK, but, uh, <coughs> but more interesting is actually the only other uh, real form of SL2C, and that's just to replace the complex numbers with real numbers, SL2R, and that acts in a more interesting way. And we'll see this repeated, this theme repeated for other groups. And uh, this one in particular acts with uh, three orbits. So uh, if you like, you can uh, reorganize this to be uh, like the upper hemisphere, the lower hemisphere, and one point out at infinity. And SL2R is uh, preserving, say, the upper hemisphere. And actually, mathematically, this has very, very significant consequences. So this is the basis, this observation here is the basis of quite a few results in number theory. I've recently become obsessed with modular forms. And this is... Uh, this is uh, really significant, but we're not going to talk about that at all, even though it's my current obsession. We will now go on back to twister theory. So <coughs> the other thing which is happening almost automatically on the first slide, that these groups like the conformal group and so on, they're not actually acting just on Minkowski space. They're acting on something a bit, uh, a bit bigger. You have to add in a few points. So for example, this, uh, this group, uh, the, this uh, uh, SU22, which occurred right at the beginning here, um, acts on, on various spaces, but in particular, one of the good, good places it acts is actually, because it's sitting inside SL4C, it's acting on this uh, complex Grassmannian, the Grassmannian of two planes in, in C4, which is a four-dimensional complex manifold. And just because you, know, you think of SL2, SL4C as just change of coordinates, it's just uh, linear transformations, it's moving planes to planes. Um, luckily, in f again, this is because things are in four dimensions, um, you can actually realize this thing by means of some quadratic equation. So that's uh, omega wedge omega for a two form being equal to zero. And that uh, puts, puts this space inside uh, CP5. This is a classical construction due, due to people like uh, Klein and Pluca. So <coughs> now you can ask about uh, what, are the, what are the orbits of this thing? So on the previous slide, we saw that the orbits of SL2R acting on the Riemann sphere were easily <laughs> viewable. Here, it's a bit more difficult to see what's going on. Um, however, there are uh, six orbits. Okay, now, uh, rather than explaining these six orbits directly in terms of this, uh, in terms of this Grassmannian, just point out that, that uh, <coughs> always under these circumstances, so this is a, a general feature, that there must always be a unique closed orbit. And always here means that uh, this is a general feature of when you've got some real form acting on something like a flag manifold, that's the, 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 the terminology for these things in general. So if you come across a, if you come across a, a flag manifold uh, and a real group acting on it, a real form of the, uh, of the complex group acting on it, you'll find that in fact there are always finitely many orbits, it's a bit surprising, and one of them is closed, that's not so surprising, um, but because there are finitely many orbits, some of them are open, and we will see this for these six orbits. Okay, in fact, in this particular case, there'll be one closed, 
three open orbits and two which are neither open nor closed. So uh, this, this, this result, there's a lot of, lot of uh, results from around the late 60s, like uh, this is uh, Joseph Wolf, Joe Wolf, and, uh, and this general result is due to him in 1969. So <laughs> these things have names. So first of all, this is the way that you may view compactified Minkowski space in such a way that the conformal group is evidently acting. And also, automatically, you've got a sort of complex version of this thing lying around. Uh, so let's have a, a different font for that. So compa complexified, compactified Minkowski space, which whereas a lot of the action is taking place in twister theory, uh, that would be denoted by uh, blackboard bowl M. Okay, so, um, right, so this is what's happening when you look at this real form. Now, how to see these, how to see these uh, six orbits? Well, you know, out of the blue, I was looking at this Grassmannian of two planes. The natural thing that uh, you would perhaps more, more naturally think of would be you just have it act on complex projective three space. So it's the same group, SU22, but you have it act on, on complex projective three space. So this is the projective space of C4, and if you're, if you're in, in twister world, you uh, denote that by T, all right? So it's the projective twister space, T. It's just another name for C4, but equipped with this group action. And, and here, it's easier because there are just three orbits, and you can see them. And it's very much like the, uh, like the picture for uh, the Riemann sphere. So what you've got, you've got... Uh, You've got this invariant emission in a product of signature 2, 2. You can look at the lines on which that, uh, on which that in a product is either positive, zero, or negative, and it gives you these uh, three possible orbits. There they are. And that yellow piece is actually a real hypersurface. So that's dimension 5, real dimension 5. So it's a, it's a bigger and better version of just the usual Riemann sphere. Right, and so now you can see the six orbits. So... How can you see them? And this is, this, is the, uh, <coughs> this is the twist of viewpoint, by the way. Right? The twist of viewpoint is it's much better, rather than looking at compactified Minkowski space, it's much better to look in this, uh, this rather simpler thing, namely complex projective three space, and see what's going on. And some things are just easier that way, and some things are really much easier and quite significant as well. Right, so this is the twist of viewpoint. So now let's look at how you see these six orbits. That's on the next slide. Okay, so this is the twist of viewpoint. Right, so, um, so there's twister space, traditional picture of twister space. This is a picture of complex projective three space, just remind you. On the other hand, what about um, the uh, Grassmannian of two planes, so compactified Minkowski space? Okay, so here's a, a, a picture of that, right? So that's the, the space of two planes inside this four-dimensional complex vector space. Uh, traditionally, is drawn like that because it's sort of mimicking what happens in the real case where you're adding something to Minkowski space and compactifying it. But it's, a, I mean, this is, you know, this is four complex dimensions. It's not a real, real good representation of that. But anyway... Here, here's, here's the way that you see all this stuff. Right, so first of all, uh, what, what about a point over on the right-hand side? How do these points, how, the, how does a point in Minkowski space become, uh, become uh, manifest itself in uh, this uh, complex projective space? Okay, so a point is a plane in uh, this uh, four-dimensional complex vector space. That becomes a line just an ordinary, everyday um, straight line in um, projective space, okay? So a linearly embedded CP1. So that, uh, that point there becomes a line. So unless you're <coughs> severely red-green colorblind, in which case, you know, <coughs> nothing has actually happened, I'll just point out there's a point on this side, and over here, that's represented exactly by a line. So again... <coughs> Barring the fact you might be color, <laughs> color blind, <coughs> Here, here's, here's another point, actually a green point, but a bright green point, and that's represented by another line over here. Right, and then the geometry on the left-hand side, it's just like, you know, 
real dimensional three space except it's complex but generically you know two lines they just miss each other right in three space but sometimes they intersect so you could ask what is the geometric interpretation on the left hand side of lines intersecting what does it mean for them to intersect and on the right hand side remember that actually this Grassmannian is embedded by means of a, comp a, a quadratic equation inside a bigger projective space and it acquires therefore a, uh, a conformal structure or if you like this is the definition of when two points are going to be null separated even in the complex setting so lines intersect on the left hand side that means exactly that these points are null separated in particular if it so happened that these two points were real points I mean put sorry points in the in the uh, real um, uh, Minkowski space or real compactified Minkowski space this would be genuinely true that these points are null separated if and only if the corresponding lines intersect so this is how you go from your ordinary everyday view of space-time which is on the right hand side to this new twister viewpoint on the left hand side you know and maybe it is I mean maybe this is the philosophy of twister theory maybe it is that not only is this the easier viewpoint on the left hand side I mean some things are clearly easier already but it may be the more natural viewpoint there may be things on the left hand side which you can more easily articulate and we will see that this is really true remarkably all right so now I was promising you that this viewpoint would illuminate the uh, six different orbits on the uh, left hand side and the point is you can see this on the right hand side and you probably you, you can see this on the left hand side because here are the possibilities Right, so the question is how, how do these lines, these, uh, these green lines here, how do they interact with the orbits which are clearly visible in twister space, namely the, uh, the piece up here, the piece down here, and this hypersurface in between? Well, there are six possibilities. Either, and I've sort of drawn some of them, either the line lies completely in this like, upper part of twister space, PT plus, that's that one, or, and that's an open condition, or, and I haven't drawn this one, it might be completely in the lower half, that's all right, that's another one, so that's two so far, or it might go from the top half, have a point on the top half, and the point in the bottom half, another open condition, so that's three open conditions. Or, and then there's three more possibilities, it might just graze, it might be in the upper, upper half place, except it just grazes this thing, it just touches at one point. Or it might be in the lower part but just grazing underneath or it might actually be completely inside it which I've tried to draw at the end here so those are those six possibilities but the point is you can just see them so easily from this point of view all right so six cases all right so now one suspects that maybe things other things are easier to view from this viewpoint okay and we'll see that, that that's really the case okay so I'm just going to do some things which are a little bit more um, sort of to keep the gods of mathematics happy I'll say this in, a, in a, a bit more of a sort of general way so you can see this sort of uh, generalizes to other situations it's not really that special some some aspects are not really that special so um, what you've really got is something like this you've got some uh, some well vector space of four dimensions this F here F stands for flag and that's a, a concept which comes from uh, representation theory and so on and algebraic geometry and this is the flag <coughs> consisting of two planes so that's why it's called F2 this on the left hand side is the flag consisting of one dimensional subspaces of, of, of that of complex projective three space and on the other hand you could think of another uh, flag manifold which consists of lines inside planes inside this four dimensional vector space so that's actually a five-dimensional natural space again on which all of these groups are acting and there's a forgetful map which you can either forget the line remember only the plane that'll be new or you can forget the line and remember forget the plane and remember only the line and that will be mu so this is a sort of tautological diagram that you can draw which occurs for many different uh, groups and so on and so forth Okay, and then we've decided to give all these things different names because it's like something to do with physics so uh, CP3 is another name for the left hand side that's a common additional name we've also called it projective twister space on the right hand side 
This is either the Grassmannian of two planes in twister space, or if you were, if you were uh, uh, wanting to uh, really emphasize the physics aspect, you call it compactified, complexified Minkowski space. And this thing on the left-hand side is then sitting inside CP5, which is where it gets its structure from, where it gets its conformal structure from. So everything that we've said so far has been assembled into this diagram. But uh, you know, one of the things you can see from this diagram is, is, is how it is that this, this uh, uh, correspondence happens between points in Minkowski space. There's this green point again. And lines over there, what you do is you just take the uh, inverse image of that under nu and project down under mu. And it gives you uh, a line over there. So that's how this correspondence works out. So a point on the, on the right-hand side corresponds to a, left, uh, a line on the left-hand side and uh, this is how one way of saying it. There are all sorts of other things which are like this, like in physics, uh, like in um, you know medical imaging, like uh, the radon transform and so on. You can set set all, all the, these things up at least formally to make them look like this. Right. So, um, <coughs> so in particular, uh, one one thing which I um, uh, would now like to emphasise is if you start with this real Minkowski space on the right hand side and you do this procedure to the entire thing. In other words, if you look at the region which is swept out in CP3 by the lines which correspond to points which happen to be in real Minkowski space rather than this compactified, complexified version, then you get this, this one orbit, this one closed orbit on the left hand side which in particular is a real hypersurface in something complex. So it has what's called a CR structure. So automatically you get a, a CR structure on the space of uh, light rays in compactified Minkowski space. Okay, so something which just, just appears like this. The other thing that's uh, perhaps the more natural orbits are these two orbits which consist of either uh, lines which are either in entirely in the upper half plane or in the lower half plane. So I give one of these a name. So this thing here consists of points there so that the, um, uh, this Hermitian product is positive definite thereon. So, it, so it's, uh, <coughs> when you restrict it to a plane, it gets uh, two possible eigenvalues, both of them positive. Okay, and that corresponds to this. So we'll, <coughs> we'll come back to this one in a moment. Right, but this is just a fancy way of saying it all, both you know, to, 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 to say it on a slightly fancy way and also to emphasize that this can generalize and does generalize to many other situations. Right, <coughs> now one thing we've been talking about so far is we've been talking about uh, Lorentz transformations and conformal transformations for the Lorentzian metric. So one should ask what happens if you try all this for um, Euclidean space instead. Okay, so, so in fact, in, in all dimensions, first of all, the compactification of Euclidean space, if you want to do it from a conformal point of view, is very easy. You just add on one point. If you search back and figure out what the compactification of Minkowski space is, not only you're adding on one point at infinity, but you're also adding on the light cone at infinity. Here, it's just one point. So the one point compactification of uh, Euclidean space is the sphere and it's a conformal transformation that's just stereographic projection from a sphere and um, <coughs> again there are lots of groups lying around so in this particular case the conformal group it's uh, instead of being 2 4 which was for, for uh, in, in four dimensions it's 1 n plus 1 for the signature and you can see that if you look at the orbit of that group in real projective space it really does look like a sphere OK, so that's orange thing, all of the orange thing, just the sphere. So in other words, the conformal group is acting here. It has three orbits, the outside of the sphere, the sphere itself, and the inside of the sphere. Um, but anyway, in uh, four dimensions, which is what we're talking about for twister theory, so uh, there's this uh, special case of SO15, and you expect, of course, that has something to do with... Uh, with you know SU22 as being the right answer if these numbers were slightly different. So it turns out that uh, again this thing is double covered by something which is in this uh, SL4C which has been prevalent throughout the whole discussion 
And the way to, uh, the way to, uh, to see it, or one way to see it, is actually that uh, what you should do is identify C4 here with uh, uh, quaternionic two space, and then look at the two by two quaternionic matrices which have unit determinant. And then <coughs> that's a two to one covering. In other words, this is a, another coincidence of lo low dimensional Lie groups, and this is spin one five. So it's a, an explicit realization of the spin group. So then what you should do is look at how all this interacts with twisters. In other words, take this group, uh, SL2H, and ask, how does it interact here? Right, so on the left-hand side, <coughs> now this is actually very unusual on the left-hand side what happens. Usually if you have a real form of a, compact, of a complex lead group acting on something which is a, a, a flag manifold, usually it has, when I say it has finitely many orbits, that's due to... Uh, Joe Wolf, you know, <coughs> if you take anything reasonably complicated, you'll get like a million orbits, right? But here, there is in fact just one, and this is very unusual. Always the compact form has just one orbit, but this one actually itself. On the left-hand side, there's just one orbit. So, you know, if, you, if you're looking for things to simplify under the twister viewpoint, this is <coughs> as simple as it gets, right? This group is acting on here transitively, strangely, very unusual. And on the right-hand side, it's also reasonably simple. On the right-hand side, there are just two orbits. Uh, one of them is, uh, as you were expecting, it's the compactification of, of Euclidean space, compactified as a sphere. And then the other one is everything else. Right? So there's this is one orbit, and then there's the complement, and that's all. But now if you count dimensions, you find something significant is going on here. This is four-dimensional, four-real dimensional, and... Uh, all of, all of the points in here correspond to complex lines inside here. Right, so 4 plus uh, 2 for a complex line, so Riemann spheres, so 4 plus 2 is the same as the real dimension of this, which is 6. And so actually what happens is that as you let your point vary inside here, the lines in here just foliate this thing. They just cover it, just on the nose. And they have to because there's just one orbit here, otherwise you'd, you'd find something which was special, out of place. But you can just see by pure thought that it has to be that way. So in other words, what you obtain is, strangely enough, you obtain a very natural vibration from complex projective three space down to the four sphere, whose fibres are in fact uh, holomorphic. They're uh, Riemann spheres, just sitting in there in the usual way. Um, Perhaps one way of, I mean, if you don't believe this, one way of seeing it is that uh, just like the two-dimensional sphere is the Riemann sphere, the four-dimensional sphere is like the uh, quaternionic version of that. It's quaternionic projective one space. And this mapping is taking the quaternionic span. Right? So you've identified C4, C4 with H2, and then you just look at the span. And that's what this is. Anyway, so this is like, this has a name. It's called the twister vibration. Um, it's like the hop vibration, very much like the hop vibration from, uh, uh, if you just lower the dimensions, from RP3 down to the Riemann 2 sphere, except you've replaced real numbers by complex numbers and complex numbers by quaternions. Anyway, so this is the twister vibration. This is, this is the, the arena in which Euclidean twister space, twister theory, should happen. Now, it's a little bit easier. Right. Right, now, 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 now just, uh, let's come right, right back to Earth and look so, so f at something from uh, prehistory, 1904. This is quite amazing. In 1904, uh, <coughs> Bateman, Harry Bateman, uh, wrote down an amazing formula. So back in 1904, you know, papers were nice and short and so on. He basically writes down this formula and then walks away, you know. So, but this is the formula, and it's a really mysterious formula. Here it is. Right, so I should explain that, that f here, you can see f is a function of four variables. There's some complex numbers lying around here. f is actually a, a holomorphic function of three complex variables. There it is. The, the x's, on the other hand, x1 up to x4, are real numbers. And that's the vector x on the left-hand side. So what you're obtaining is a, a function of four real variables from a holomorphic function of three variables, three complex variables, of course. And somehow this, this integral formula 
it's a, it's a, a contour integral. So this is a, a some closed contour somehow in the complex plane. Right, now, of course, you have to have something a little bit significant going on here because, you know, if you've got a holomorphic function in the complex plane and you, if, if it's entire and you integrate it around a closed contour, you'll get zero. So they have to have some sort of poles and things like that. It's all a bit unclear what's going on. It's very unclear what's going on. However, just formally, if you differentiate this thing under the integral sign, you find that on the left-hand side you get something which is harmonic. All right, so... Uh, you know, what's going on here? So, and these are frequently asked questions between <laughs> 1904 and 1980, right? A 76-year hiatus where people didn't understand what, what was going on here. People tried to. I mean, and you, you, can, you can find articles where they try. Yeah. <laughs> okay, since I'm being recorded, I better not um, <laughs> cast too many aspersions here. But anyway... <laughs> So people tried and, and, and basically did not understand what was going on until 1980, roughly speaking, roughly speaking. Right, so for example, you know, I've already lamented the fact that F may be, I don't know where F is defined somewhere, I don't know, a bit complicated, where, where, where do you put your contour? You know, if you move, move your contour around a little bit by Cauchy's formula, it doesn't matter too much where you put gamma, so, but... Uh, you know, nevertheless, somehow F has to have poles and gamma has to avoid poles and things like that. And, uh, and then there's a the question of, you know, which uh, functions actually appear this way. You know, this might be a very interesting formula. You might always get zero. That would be no good at all. Ideally, what you'd get is the general harmonic function of, th of four variables. Anyway, these things are answered. Uh, very clear now what's going on. It's uh, really answered by Euclidean twisters and it's answered by something called the Penrose transform, which is what I'm about to discuss. Um, I'm, right, so there'll be a little bit of preliminary before we actually get to the answers and, of course, I'm not going to give you any details, but you're just going to have to suspend disbelief. But the point is that if you look at the, the, the formula for the integrand, in other words, the relationship between the x's and these three complex variables which are here, you find that that's actually, the, that's actually an explicit formula for the twist of vibration in the Euclidean setting. So, you know, there's some, some hint that this is the right thing already. Euclidean twist is the right thing, just by looking at the formula for the integrand. Anyway, suspend this belief and we'll just go and talk about some generalities and then I'll come back to this shortly. All right, so... <coughs> now, the other thing which really comes out of... Uh, symmetry considerations and twister theory and so on. The other thing which is always present in twister theory and <coughs> present much more generally, so this is the start of something big, is, <coughs> the, um, is the notion of invariant differential operators. So let me just discuss a few invariant differential operators and, and what this means even. So remember that one of, the, one of the things that you've got here is that the natural arenas that you are playing with, such as uh, either compactified Minkowski space or, okay, compactified Minkowski space or uh, the um, force sphere, these are homogeneous spaces for various groups. Okay, so one of them for SU22, the other one for SL2H. And both of these groups are sitting inside SL4C. And they're both actually sitting inside the Minkowski, in, 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 sitting inside uh, this Grassmannian of two planes. So, you know, here they are sitting inside this Grassmannian of two planes, and it means you can realize these things quite explicitly. So you have to realize your Hermitian form in a slightly strange way in order to get it to be block upper triangular, block your upper triangular like that. But that's the sort of natural subgroup that you have lying around. But independent of that, what you can do is you can ask for differential operators which have a certain invariance. And the simplest possible invariance that you would like is, from this point of view, you would just like them to be G invariant, whatever that means. Because you've got this group lying around, which, is, which I'm now calling G, just to emphasize that this could be much more general. And you can ask for G invariant differential operators. And when you do that, you get a, a, a really cool answer, just for uh, compactified Minkowski space. So there's a classification. 
It is very important for this classification that G actually happens to be a, a certain type of Lie group and P happens to be another certain type of Lie group, but this is something which happens uh, in general. Okay, now, and actually this is much better. This is much better than Riemannian or just uh, Lorentzian differential geometry. In Riemannian differential geometry, if you ask for invariant operators, there are just heaps of them, right? You've got, you've got the metric to play with, you've got the levity to connection to play with. Uh, you can write any sort of complete contraction of these things. You know, you can take, you can just manufacture far too many Riemannian invariant operators. Um, it's reasonably difficult to even start writing down conformally invariant differential operators, and so it's a bit of a miracle. So it's really good that you know this problem is exactly the right difficulty that you can actually give a complete answer. So here are some differential operators which are indeed invariant. Uh, for example, all of the operators in the Durham complex. This is my notation for the Durham complex. So these are all invariant. In four dimensions, the, um, the two forms uh, split up into those which are self-dual and those which are anti-self-dual. And this is, un this is a conformally invariant concept. So you can just do that. You can split them up. In the Lorentzian case, you'd have to be talking about uh, complex-valued forms. In the Riemannian case, real forms just split up like this. So there we are. And there's a, a pattern, a pattern of invariant differential operators. So <coughs> The claim is that actually this pattern, right, so all I'm doing is replacing these bundles by other bundles, which are now not going to be specified. This pattern just repeats itself over and over again. You can classify all of the conformally invariant differential operators in this sense, the G invariant ones, uh, between irreducible bundles. You can classify all of them. And this, this really is getting into some much more interesting um, representation theory, in fact. So um, <coughs> here, is, here is a picture of something that you could actually buy, not necessarily online, you'd have to go to a shop, in the late uh, 19th century. And you could buy these things and you could uh, amuse your friends at dinner parties. You know, before you had mobile phones and things to look at, you say, would you like to see my spheres? Right? So you, you get one of these things out and it's very carefully made out of you know, nice plaster and so on, and it's coloured. And this is a picture of a real one. And, and actually, this is, this, is, this is very much related to what's going on here because you know, the main group involved here is SL4C. Uh, this is a semi-simple Lie group. It has a vial group, and these are actually the vial chambers. These are actually, if you just put, a, put something at the center of the sphere mm. and look at these, these things as chambers filling up all of R3, these are so-called vial chambers. And you can see this pattern of differential operators on the sphere. This is something which generalizes, of course, to many other manifolds. And here is this, uh, this uh, there's, a, there's a loon here, there's a quarter of a sphere, which is exactly partitioned up, just like that is. This is not a coincidence. This is what's really going on in mathematics. All right, so these are the SL4C vial chambers. All right, now I'm going, to, I'm going to drop that. This is something which you can pursue, you know, carefully and, and so on. It's a really interesting topic. But <coughs> the point is that in four dimensions, this story is relatively straightforward and you can classify all of these things. Right, so now let's get on to something slightly more interesting, the massless field equations. I'm just going to write them down. Fortunately, I don't need to explain this to, uh, to this particular audience. So these are the helicity, uh, <coughs> traditionally... Um, uh, labelled with a half integer, so helicity greater than zero, uh, less than zero, depending on when you're having primed or unprimed spinner indices. These are spinners in the, in, in the uh, convention of Roger Penrose, or even helicity zero, which strangely enough is a second order differential equation rather than the first order differential equation. All of these things are conformally invariant. For example, uh, when um, S is equal to plus or minus one. You actually get part of that diagram before. You get the Maxwell equations or the Maxwell operators. When uh, S is a half, and it's conformally invariant, of course, when S is a half or, or two, or plus or minus a half or plus or minus two, you either get the Dirac equation or some equation having something to do with gravity. And again, that, that's what you get in this, 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 this pattern. 
includes these things. These are conformally invariant too. They have to be since this, this was a classification. So all these massless field equations you have on the left-hand side. And really remarkably, the Penrose transform actually now gives you a way of uh, viewing these things from twister theory, and they simplify drastically. The equations simplify drastically. They sort of evaporate. So let's, let's see how that happens. I mean, you might not think that they've simplified because of the answer, but, but you, know, you have to take my word for it. They really have. So, uh, okay. so remember, for example, that this, uh, this uh, particular part of twister theory, this upper half, half space, was related to some open subset in Minkowski space. And it turns out that now, if you look at the, uh, the massless, roughly speaking, if you look at the uh, massless field equations on compactified uh, Minkowski space of helicity S, as on the previous slide, and uh, you ask that they so be so-called positive frequency. This means actually that they, they extend holomorphically into this uh, uh, M++. Plus plus. It's just like Fourier series, where you have a Fourier series on the equator, of a, of a sphere extending either to the upper half space or the lower half space, depending on the, uh, on the frequency of the Fourier coefficients. And, you know, and, well, it's what, yes. And, and on the, on, on twister po from the twister point of view, these things are uniformly um, represented by this gadget. Right, so this gadget is something which is you know, very familiar from complex analysis, from several complex variables and algebraic geometry. It's a so-called cohomology group. The point is that there's this parameter involved, which is very, very natural on complex projective space. This has many different interpretations on the right-hand side. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's something, it's one of the first things that you would think about if you were talking about this, uh, this, uh, this space. Okay, and, uh, and this... Again, in 1969, Roger Penrose wrote down something which is interpretable as this. There are lots more interpretations around the same time of similar sorts of things. So obviously something was in the air. The Euclidean version is really easy. The Euclidean version, if you take a, a, any open subset inside here, <coughs> then you can realise that as a, a, one of these cohomology spaces on just the inverse image, any open subset, really good. And that's an, an explanation of Bateman's formula. It really is. Bateman's formula is what happens if you write this out in a, in a uh, check representative. Okay. Two minutes? One minute. One minute. One minute. Okay. All right. Curve to actually, so one, one thing is I can just cut to, uh, to, to Matt Check's uh, talk here. Matt Check is going to tell you about curve twister theory, a little bit more about self-duality, where you ask, when you take these, the, these uh, flat situations which we've been discussing, can you deform them a little bit and get something nice? And you can. So this is another major milestone in twister theory. Uh, Roger Penrose's article in 1976. Okay, so I've just written down the same thing with some different symbols here, meaning that it's all a bit curved. And on the right-hand side, that's a curved version of the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, you can see something going on here to do with alpha surfaces. In both cases, it's that the vial tensor should be anti-self-dual to make either of these things go. But the point is, from the <laughs> complex viewpoint, there's a well-developed theory which you can just bring in from the outside. Uh, finally, uh, if I uh, write 30 seconds for two slides, there's the twister equation, which is another conformally invariant equation. Looks like that. The point is you can reassemble this one and you get out some, some connection, which is to do with conformal geometry and so on. This, this, and it's conformally invariant, this entire thing. And this was actually something which was discovered uh, heaps earlier by Elie Cartan. So this goes back to uh, Elie Cartan's version of uh, conformal geometry. Or uh, Tracy Yerkes Thomas, a few years later, which is actually a formula much more related to this one. And then if you uh, ask what's going on in general, this is my spin-off slide. So you found lots of homogeneous spaces, lots of things going on here to do with either conformal differential geometry, CR differential geometry, or projective differential geometry. And uh, in all cases, P is actually a parabolic subgroup of a semi-simple Lie group. So this is a story which happens in very much more generality. And these are the two 
two articles where this terminology actually uh, comes from. And then since then, there have been heaps of de developments by many authors, too numerous to mention. Okay, so thank you for your at attention. You. And uh, <laughs> right, and, and all George's birthday is not <laughs> until later in the week. <coughs> I will just uh, <laughs> happy birthday. Michael, I'm sure you will get plenty of questions during the conference, and because you're really running a little bit late already, yep. I would like to move on to Carlo, not to shorten too much the coffee break, yes. but I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. So let's thank Michael again. Thank you.